I want to talk to you today about the unsettling solution for just about everything. If, if you and I today would, would receive what we're going to talk about and, and begin to walk in it and, and, and practice it, it would change our, our marriages. If you're a single adult, if you would receive what we're going to talk about today and you walk in it and practice it, it'll change your dating life. It, it, it'll change your parenting for the good. It'll make you a better boss. It'll make you a better em- employee. It'll, it'll make you a better, a better person. What, what I want to talk to you about today is what makes Christianity different than every other faith in the history of mankind. What I want to talk to you about today is the best gift that the church can give to the world because this thing is what makes Jesus different. I want to talk to you today about grace. Grace changes everything. Grace is the unsettling solution to most of our relational dilemmas. And the reason that grace is so unsettling is we all really, really want it. But it's really, really hard to give away. We all want to receive it but we get really uncomfortable when it's time to give it. Grace is powerful. I want to give you an example. You ready for an example? So my uh, oldest son is 21. And right now, he is doing door-to-door sales. So I want you to picture that in your mind. This dude is pounding the pavement. Uh, This summer, he's up in Minneapolis. He did this last summer, and the crazy thing is he chose to do this again. (laughs) Door-to-door sales. So 10 hours a day, six days a week of rejection, (laughs) right? He's doing a great job this summer. He's already passed his numbers from last summer. He still has two months to go, but every once in a while, he has a difficult day. And he'll text me or he'll text his mom. His name's Josh. He's like, you know, today's a a harder day. And I'm super proud of him. He's got the gift of gab. Have no idea where he got that, but he can talk. (laughs) And I'm proud of him for that talent, but I'm more proud of him for the grit. You know what I mean? Just the grit of door to door, six days a week, 10 hours a day. But every once in a while, the dude needs a little encouragement. You know what I'm saying? And so he'll call his mom or he'll call me or he'll text us and he'll be like, I, I, I need some encouragement. And, and so a few weeks back, you know, he, he sent me one of those messages and I texted him right back and we kind of had a text conversation because most of our conversations lately are by text. And then the next morning I got up and I was looking at Instagram and I discovered this dude on Instagram that is like super positive. He's from Florida, he's an older guy, and usually he's holding his phone, you know, up like this because you look better from this angle. Has everybody figured that out? I look terrible with the double chins, but you get me up here, it's felt, you know? It just, lo- it just looks good, right? So he's, he's holding the camera up, and he's got a hat on, and he's like standing in a Florida swamp, and he's got like lily pads all around him. He's super positive. He's got over half a million followers. Some of his videos have over 20 million views, all right? Just, just positive. And, and here's what he said in that video. He said, you know what, man? If I'm having a hard day, you know what I do, friend? I just ask myself three questions. Number one, am I alive? <laughs> I usually am. <laughs> Number two, am I living in the land of the free and the home of the brave? I usually am. Number three, I'm going to change it just a little bit. Number three, is the sun shining down on me from heaven above making my skin glow? Are there beautiful stars at night? Is that where I am, brother, brother? I always am. Today's going to be a fantastic day. And then he'll say something like this. So don't let the negative get you down, man. You're driving in traffic. Somebody cuts you off. Just think to yourself, oh, man, they must be on a grand adventure. 
Somebody rude to you in the grocery store, that happens to me, man. I just giggle to myself and I think to myself, I can't believe people go through life like that, you know? <laughs> Today going to be the greatest day of my life. And the video goes off. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you, that made you smile, that made you feel good on some level? <laughs> ask myself three questions. Am I alive? I usually am. Right? <laughs> what he's talking about in that video, and I changed it just a little bit because we in church. He, he has a little colorful language on occasion, okay? <laughs> but what he's talking about theologically, we would put this in the realm of what's known as common grace. Common grace is things that we all experience that are, that are good. So what, what, did, what did he say? Because this guy is not, not preaching Jesus, okay? But he has some understanding of common grace. And by the way, all common grace comes from God. But, but what is he saying? I have the gift of life. I woke up today breathing in and out. And here's what he's saying, right? You, you know what he's saying. I'm grateful for that. And gratitude feels good. Anytime you're grateful, you're acknowledging grace. I'm going to say that again. Anytime you are grateful, you are acknowledging grace. And then what did he say? Am I in the land of the free and the home of the brave? I usually am. He says, I'm thankful for America. I'm thankful for freedom. I'm thankful for people who sacrificed in, in big ways, even gave their life so that I might live. Anytime you're, you're grateful, you're acknowledging the reality of, of grace. And I changed the last one a little bit, but, but I'm grateful for the sunshine, you know? I'm grateful for the beautiful stars at, at, at night. Let's just think about right now, what, what are you grateful for? I'm grateful for air conditioning. Yeah. Air conditioning at this time of the year where most of us live here in Arizona is a gift of God's amazing grace. <laughs> and I know that because a couple of summers ago, my air conditioning went out. And you know what I was grateful for? I could go spend the night in a hotel, glory to God, amazing grace, because they had air conditioning there. <laughs> Make sense? Okay, now think about this for a minute. So let's, let's put this together, okay? So anytime I'm grateful, I'm acknowledging the reality of grace. What does gratitude do to your heart and soul? I mean... Just a moment ago, I, I did a little experiment with you, you know. I, I did the little Uncle Pappy impersonation, the guy on Instagram, right? Am I alive? I usually am. And all of you smiled on some level, right? It just kind of just kind of lifted us up just a little bit. Okay, now here's the thing. That's the common grace of God that envelops the planet every day. The Bible says his mercy is new every morning. You wake up to a brand new batch of mercy and grace every day. Now, here's the thing. Common grace is available to, to everyone. And, and just this little piece that I pointed out to you through Uncle Pappy and impersonating him just now, just this little piece of common grace that you and I acknowledged in that moment, what did it do? It, it lifted us just a little bit. Now, let's put it at a whole nother level level. When you experience not just the common grace of God, but the Christ-given grace of God in your life, in a personal way, it changes you. It doesn't make you smile just for a moment. Oh, that felt good. It begins to work in your soul. It changes you from the inside out for the rest of your life. Catch this now. And, and for all eternity. Grace is powerful. But it's unsettling. First off, it's unsettling because it's not fair. God's not fair. Everybody, you don't want him to be. Fair is we all get what we deserve. You, you ever had a moment where you got found out? Like, oh man, 
in high school, I had a curfew. And I remember one particular night, I came home before the curfew. I waited on my parents to go to bed, and then I went back out (laughs) after the curfew. And I felt so free and good, and I remember walking up to the front door and thinking to myself, there's a light on in there. (laughs) And I thought, "Uh uh-oh. I did wrong. I knew I did wrong. And you know what I wanted in that moment? Grace. (laughs) When I opened that door and my mom and stepdad were sitting there at three o'clock in the morning waiting for me and they were not in a good mood, I wanted, say the word with me, Grace. grace. See, here's one of the other unsettling things about grace is you can't experience it if you think you're entitled to it. I'm going to say that again. That's really important. You can't experience it if you think you're entitled to it. To really experience the grace of God in your life, you have to come to this understanding that, that you don't deserve it. You can't deserve grace any more than you can throw your own surprise party. It kind of ruins it, you know? It kind of voids the surprise. And if you think you deserve grace or that you're entitled to it, it it nullifies it, it it voids it. You can't experience the the power of it. It's it's unsettling in all kinds of different ways, but grace is the unsettling solution (laughs) to just about everything. Let me give you a definition for grace. It's in your notes. Um, You can follow along with me on the Sun Valley app. You can download that for free on your mobile device. But we'll talk about this definition over the next few weeks, and, and we'll build on it. This is what grace is, okay? You take everything the Bible says about grace, you compress it. Here's what it is. Grace is undeserved. It's unearned. And it's unearnable favor. Now, don't just read it. Let's think about it. Grace is undeserved, unearned, and unearnable favor. If you work for it, you feel like you deserve it, you feel like you're entitled to it, it's no longer grace. Grace, by definition, cannot be earned. It can only be received. And grace is what makes Jesus so confusing. Grace is what makes a lot of the Bible confusing. You ever read something in the Bible and you're like, I don't get it. Welcome to the reality of the infinite grace and infinite truth colliding at the same time in the person of God revealed to us in in Jesus. Let me show you this verse of scripture. This is our verse for the series. This is John 1.14. And when we read the words of John, if you're new to church, you're like, who's John? John was Jesus' best friend. Jesus had these like 12 disciples, you know, and you see that like in the painting of the Last Supper. You can see the 12 there. But Jesus was closest to three, Peter, James, and John, and he was closest to John. And so John, as an old man, uh, writes part of the Bible. He writes the book of John, and then he writes the cleverly named first, second, and third John, okay? I worked really hard on the creativity there. But what he's doing is he's talking about his encounters with Jesus and and what he learned because he was Jesus' best friend. This is what he says in John chapter 1, verse 14. He's talking this big theological language, and he's kind of painting this picture. And he calls Jesus the word. This was originally written in Greek. The word word means Logos. Think logo, think icon. Okay? It's a representation. It's it's the brand. Okay? So this is what he says. The word became flesh. What he's saying is God became a man. He's talking about Jesus. He's literally saying if you want to know the brand of God, the logo, the icon, if you want to know what God is like, here's what you do. You look at Jesus because God is infinite. He's eternal. He doesn't have any boundaries or limitations. 
We are finite and small. He's very, very large. He's infinite in every way. But he has a personality, intellect, feelings, and will. If you want to know who he is, what his personality is like, you look at Jesus. That's what he's saying. The word God, because how can we understand a being like that, wrapped himself up in our form so that we could understand who he is. That's what that means. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. What's he saying? He's saying, I've seen it. The other disciples, the people that knew Jesus, we've seen it. That's the we he's talking about there. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only son, Jesus. The glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of, say the last three words out loud with me, full of, say it with me, grace and truth. Full of grace and truth couple of things about that. When he writes that, he's not talking about a balance of grace and truth. That's not what he said. He said full of grace and truth. What does that mean? Jesus is all truth and Jesus is all grace all the time. Full of grace and truth. Now let's make this Real personal, real fast. Here's what this means for you. God knows everything about you. He knows all the truth of you. All your past, all your present, and all your future. God knows every thought. God knows every action. God knows everything. There are no secrets with with him. He is full of all the truth about you. And at the same time, he is full of all kinds of grace for you. Jesus is full of grace and, and truth. And people didn't know what to do with Jesus. because they wanted him to be all one or all the other. And the truth is the human soul needs both. In fact, love is all grace and all truth all the time. That's what love is. We all have this deep longing for somebody to to know everything about us and still fully accept us. As we are, not as we should be, because all of us know we're not as we should be. Can I get a witness? See, Jesus had this tendency to like hang out with sinners and tell them they were sinners and yet love them and be with them. And religious people would look at Jesus and be like, what is that about? And what's amazing about Jesus is people that were nothing like him really, really liked him. I'm going to say it again. People that were nothing like him really, really liked him. And Jesus had this ability to tell people the truth about their own lives, and yet they felt fully loved and fully accepted at the same time. How does he do that? Well, he's full of grace and and truth. One particular disciple, his name is Matthew. He wrote a book in the Bible. Do you know what it's called? Matthew, there you go. Matthew is his Greek name. His Jewish name is Levi. And here's what Matthew, that's Greek, Levi, same guy. Here's what he did for a living. He was a tax collector. If you've ever read any of the New Testament, perhaps you've seen some of that. They would categorize people and sometimes they would say tax collectors and sinners. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Tax collectors and sinners. Here's what that's about. Levi was a Jewish person His name was Levi, which means he's from, (laughs) his lineage is a group of Hebrew people called the Levites. They were the priests. So he's got this very special name, but he grew up and became a tax collector. Here's why tax collectors were regarded as bad people. They were Jewish people that went to work for the Romans to collect taxes. And as they collected taxes from their fellow Jews, they would add to it and get rich off of it. They were turncoats, they were traitors, they were Benedict Arnolds. 
And so Jesus is putting together his disciples. Jesus is a rabbi. Uh, He's a spiritual teacher. He's gaining in popularity. So he invites some fishermen, you know, hey, Peter, uh, come and follow me. Perhaps you know that name. Some others come and follow me. And he's, he's building this group. And one day he walks by Matthew, Levi, the tax collector's booth. And he looks at Matthew and says, Matthew, you follow me. Now, here's the thing about Peter and Andrew and the other guys that were Jesus' disciples. They're like, we're not perfect, okay? We know that. But Matthew is a tax collector. And my guess is, in that moment, as Jesus is walking by the tax collector's booth, and he looks at Matthew and says, you follow me too, Peter and Andrew and the other guys, John, they were thinking, this is going to ruin the brand, Like right out of the gate, Jesus is ruining this. And to take it a step further, Matthew hadn't repented yet. He was still a tax collector. He leaves the booth, but he had a bunch of subordinates because there's a lot of taxes to collect and he was building a business. He was getting rich off this thing. So he said, yeah, Jesus, I'll go for a walk with you, right? And he follows him. And Jesus says, here's what I want to do, Matthew. I want to go to your house. Matthew has yet to repent. This is the pre-repentant Matthew, okay? And he says, pre-repentant Matthew, I want you to be my follower. And Matthew's like, all right. And Jesus says, I want to go to your house. And Matthew's thinking, you sure you want to go to my house? And Jesus is like, yeah, I, I I want to meet your friends. Now think about the friends that a tax collector would have. Your family would disown you because they're embarrassed. You would have no Jewish friends because they think you're terrible, right? And any Jewish friends like you, uh, if they were your friend, they're probably a prostitute, a gambler, a drunkard. They're kind of outside social norms. That's the only friends you've got. And so Matthew likes to party, and he's like, you want to meet some of my friends? I don't know if you do. They're all parties, partiers, and Jesus is like, I, I want to meet your friends. And so Jesus goes to Matthew's house. What we're about to read is in the context of a party. And all of Matthew's friends are there, And this rabbi, who's full of grace and truth, God made flesh because the word became flesh and dwelt among us. God in the flesh is at this party with all of these sinners. And here's what happens. Pick up with me here. Matthew chapter 9, verse 10. It says, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, and by the way, in this culture... Having dinner with someone was a sign of friendship and acceptance. Having a meal in someone's home in this culture was a big deal. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors, there's a whole group of them, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees, that's the religious leaders of the day, and they would watch Jesus and kind of spy on him and, you know, see what he was doing. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? In other words, hey guys, your leader, this guy you're following, why is he hanging out with outcasts? Why is he hanging out with all the people that our culture cancels? Why is he hanging out with all of these people that would make him ceremonially unclean? Why is he hanging out with the riffraff? We don't do this. This isn't right. Is he condoning their life? What, 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 is, he, what is he doing? And this is loud enough, and this is obvious enough. The disciples are talking about it, and they, they bring it to Jesus. So they they talk to Jesus, verse 12. On hearing this, Jesus said, now at this moment, Jesus is speaking. Uh, Matthew and the other party goers are in earshot, okay? So the religious people say, why is Jesus hanging out with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, hey guys, lighten up. Hey, these guys are okay. We're not gonna worry about it. I'm not gonna address it. Hey, guys, we probably don't want to get on to them. They might raise our taxes. Jesus doesn't say that. What does he say? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but uh, what's the next word? But the sick. Okay, think about that for a moment. 
It's not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. So put yourself in Matthew's shoes. You're there at the party. All your friends are there. This conversation is, is happening. Now, now the, the loudness of the party's kind of dialed it down, right? If there's a record player playing, does anybody remember records? You guys remember that? Like it's, it's, the, scratch, it's the scratch across the record. Like everything stops and everybody's hearing this. And Matthew's going, surely Jesus is going to stick up for me, right? And Jesus says, it's not the healthy that need a doctor, but the... So if you're Matthew, you're thinking, Jesus, are you calling me sick? You calling my friends sick? You calling, like, the people you're having dinner here with sick? And what's the answer? Yes. Jesus is saying, yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a sickness here. I, I came for those of you who are sick and, and aware of it. Can you imagine the downer that is at the party in this moment? It would be like some of you on a Friday night, like you're having dinner somewhere, right, with a bunch of friends, and, and you had a little too much to drink, and all of a sudden I walk in. <laughs> Why are you laughing, right? <laughs> You'd be like, dude, we like you for Sunday services, but not on, not on Friday night. This is, this is one of those kind of moments. Listen, and Jesus doesn't back off. In fact, he's, he's going heavy. The people that he's there with, the people that he loves, the people that he's having dinner with, he says, yeah. You guys are sick. Verse 13. Talking to the religious leaders, Jesus says, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I'll explain that here in a moment. For I have not come to call the righteous, but what's the next word? Sinners. Sinners. Fascinating. I haven't come to call the righteous, but sinners. Why am I with all these sick people? <laughs> all these sinners? Because there's why I came. Full of grace. Full of truth. I'm going to tell you how to remember this story. Jesus is not afraid to call a sinner a sinner, and he's not afraid to go to their house for dinner. I'm going to say it again. You guys can fill in the blanks so we remember it. <laughs> Jesus is not afraid to call a sinner a sinner. And Jesus is not afraid to go to their house for dinner. dinner. You see how confusing Jesus is? What's fascinating about Jesus, he doesn't do the cancel culture thing. He tells the truth. He doesn't back away from it. And he deeply loves people he disagrees with. Full of grace, full of truth. And he knows everything about you. Everything you have done, are doing, and will do. He knows every regret, every remorse, all the shame. He knows all the truth. And he loves you. And he'll have dinner with you too. And welcome you in. Three things about grace. Number one, here in your notes. Did you like that rhyme, by the way? Not afraid to call a sinner a sinner and not afraid to go to their house. Worked really hard on that. Number one, <laughs> grace. Grace is relational and personal. Grace is relational and personal. See, here's the thing about, about grace. It, it's all about an imbalance in the relationship. You've done wrong, and there's somebody that has power over you. And the only way to experience grace is through that personal connection and, and them giving it to you. 
And this is how it is with God. I wrote this down. This is extra. You can write this down if you want. We would have never known the grace of God without the relational presence of God. We would have never known the grace of God without the relational presence of God. We would have known God's rules. We would have known God's principles and precepts. But we would have never known the grace of God without seeing it in Jesus. The fascinating thing about God made flesh, the word made flesh, full of grace and truth, is Jesus went to the most irreligious. And he hung out with the most sinful. Right now, we're not going to say it out loud, but in your mind, think of a category of people that the church rejects. Okay, Matthew and all of his friends would be in that type of category. And yet Jesus hung out with pre-repentant sinners and loved them. Jesus is different than us. If you're going to experience his grace, it must be personal. For many of us, grace, if you've grown up in church, if you've been around it, grace is like a doctrine. And I'll just tell you, you you, you can know it objectively, but you don't experience the power of it until you experience it subjectively, personally. God's grace is for you. He knows everything about you. And he loves you. Second thing, grace cannot be experienced without truth. There's no entitlement to grace. Why? Because grace is undeserved. It's unearned, an unearnable favor. And you cannot really experience the grace of God without acknowledging the truth of your own life. It's like that surprise party thing. If you feel entitled to grace, it's, it's, it's null and void. You, you can't experience it. And the unsettling thing about grace is the only way to experience with God is to acknowledge our own sin. Not hide it, not run from it, but stare it in the face and take it to God and give it to him. And God in his love and mercy and grace will meet you there. He's full of truth. He knows all about it. He's not winking at it. He's not saying, oh, you know, forget about it. No, no, he acknowledges it. And even in acknowledging it, still, still loves you. The amazing thing about Jesus is he called sinners sinners, and then he gave his life for them on the cross. Because on the cross, you see God's love and justice meet. You see grace and truth meet. The ugliness of our sin and the beauty of grace. And this is what, this is what love is. Number three, Jesus is all grace and all truth all the time. Jesus is all grace and all truth all the time. Jesus never waters down the truth and he never turns down the grace. He's full of both at the same time. He loves the real you. The you that you're too ashamed to talk to anybody else about. The the, the you that that, that you hope nobody else finds out about. Like, Like the secret you. Every thought, every feeling, every emotion... He knows it all, and he loves you. See, and here's the thing about that love. It will change you. Shocking thing is truth never changed anybody's life. Makes us feel bad. Makes us regret. There's shame but we tend to just run around this circle of repeating it and repeating it and repeating it. You know what will change you? Grace. Getting help from God in the midst of that truth. Taking it to God, acknowledging his love in in the middle of all the shame and regret and allowing his love to work in us and through us. Because grace changes 
everything. Here's what we're going to do over the next few weeks. We're going to learn his grace together. How to receive it and how to give it away to others. And his grace changes everything. I mean, just think about it earlier in the service. You got, you got just a little taste of that common grace and all of us kind of lifted a little bit. I'll just tell you, it's way, way more rich than that. Over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about the truth. And we're going to talk about grace as we talk about Jesus. I want to encourage you to do two things. The first is I want to encourage you to get involved in a group. Over the next few weeks, we have an opportunity for you to make some friends. We're going to talk about what we talk about on the weekend. And so I want to encourage you to take that step. It'll help you understand some things deeper. It'll help you learn a little better. And so you can go to groups.sv.cc and we'll get you connected. And there's groups at all of our locations. And so I want to encourage you to take that step. The other thing that I want to encourage you to do is be here every week as we learn this together. Next week, we've got a special weekend. We're calling it our Friends and Family Weekend. There's activities at all of our locations, lots of fun uh, for your kids. It's a great opportunity to invite somebody. In fact, you've got some invitations in your seat. I want to encourage you to take those and invite somebody. And next week, we'll dive in. And over the next few weeks, we'll learn grace together. Sound good? Yeah. All right. Let's pray together. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? And maybe here in the next few seconds, as I, I give just a, a little space, maybe you want to ask God, even if, even if you don't believe in him yet, maybe you'd even be willing just, just, to, just to pray as part of the process of your investigating this. Maybe just say, God, would you give me wisdom of your grace and truth? Let me pray for all of us. Holy Spirit, give us wisdom of these things. Give us wisdom of the reality of our sin and give us wisdom of the reality of your grace. Thank you that you love pre-repentant sinners. <laughs> you work in our lives before we even want to try. You work in our lives before we even want to walk your way. And there's a bunch of us right now, that's what's happening in this moment. You're working in our lives even when we don't have any want to have anything to do with it. That's what your love does. And so for some of us, I pray we would acknowledge that, that we would come back, that we would learn together. And I pray that over the next few weeks, you would give us wisdom of grace and truth. May we learn it because your power and your grace in our lives changes everything. Teach us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.